try. Yeah. So we're actually catching up to the live stream. Hello, everybody. If there's anybody there still waiting. Sorry about the delay. I was running a little bit behind today. But today, welcome to another Wine Shark Wednesday. It's I, your host, the Wine Shark. And we are going to be talking today about size matters and there's just a ton of double entendre to do here sorry i'm opening up my bottle of wine for you guys today so that i can sip along for our grocery store grab anyway um i've been thinking a bunch about various different wine topics as i want to do and still nothing had really come up as a big kind of hey i want to talk about it this week but i have been watching a couple of wine documentaries and doing my usual readings and you know, checking out industry rags, things like that. And this topic has come up in various ways uh, over time that I wanted to uh, kind of review. And basically, talk about the, the differences between big wineries and small wineries, um, talking about uh, what the virtues and vices there are. But uh, before we get started with that, um, we'll do a little housekeeping. Let's talk about, uh, talk about what's been going on. Oh, hello to Ms. Boswell and Ms. Dan. Hello, hello, hello. Um, We've been uh, staying busy. Um, we, we've launched officially the Date Night Wine product. So you guys can go on Groupon and purchase yourself a Date Night Wine gig, which is a bottle of wine and a custom-made wine shark charcuterie board and a couple of nice crystal glasses, a little brief class. I fill up the charcuterie board, tell you about the wine and its theme and kind of the match of what's going on. It's a lot of fun, and you guys should check it out. So that's kind of cool. Um, progress continues on the Wine Shark Shark Board. Uh, which is the actual kind of paint-by-numbers charcuterie-style board that I'm working on. Uh, I've been doing recipe development and trying to figure out what the end product is actually going to look like. Um, whether we utilize some of the very excellent artisans out there that have made actual shark-shaped uh, charcuterie boards, as I was lucky enough to be given by my loving little sister for Christmas, uh, or whether we just do a plain-style board that we focus mostly on just like the areas that we're going to fill in. So more work in progress. Uh, but we've also got upcoming shows. Um, we did our first Facebook mini class last night. Uh, so we did a wine basics, just a quick 20 minute lesson on the four S's and how to hold a wine glass. Many of you have seen this at the beginning of many of my shows, uh, whether at the Renaissance Festival or in person shows. But bottom line is it's great knowledge for anybody to come check out. It's an easy uh, 30 minute, not even 30 minute class, uh, just five bucks. And it's right there hosted on Facebook Live. Plus, you can access the content later. Very cool stuff. Um, we had a very successful event downtown with events with Amy doing a Girl, Girl Scout cookie pairing. So that was a lot of fun. We uh, got uh, eight different eight different cookie varieties in the beer and wine com combination. So four paired with beer, four paired with wine, and we had a lot of fun. My friend uh, Bob from Two Penny Beer came down and helped out and did his own thing. So uh, we uh, basically just all of us got together and really kind of dug into the fun things that go along with Girl Scout cookies and the challenges that we see with pairing them. Uh, fun part is, you know, there were definitely some out-of-the-park winners and some uh, surprising things, to be frank. So kind of fun. Definitely look forward to doing that again. And don't forget to support your local Girl Scouts. Go ahead and grab yourself a box or two. Uh, and we've got a beer and wine pairing show this weekend as well. Also down at the Reunion Tower, myself and Too Many Beer are back, and we are going to be teaching you about food and beer and wine and beer and beer and beer pairings. We have lots of fun stuff to show you. Three different wines, three different uh, beers, both paired with the individual tastings. So you're going to get the same dish paired with both wine and beer, so you can compare and contrast. We talked about strengths and weaknesses and kind of some of the fun things that you can learn by doing both at the same time. So... That's going to be a lot of fun. And then the week following that, we've got Wine Shark Spring Fling coming. So we've got uh, finally, you know, getting out of this winter weather and in, in, as we as we reach into March. And uh, we'll be talking about lighter side wines, perfectly fit for the wonderful spring of the season. So hopefully we'll all be able to, you know, get out of the house soon. Maybe, you know, we hope. Anyway, uh, so let's talk about uh, little and big and the virtues in between. Uh, we've got uh, a long history of thinking about wine from a lot of different angles, uh, from extremely uh, well-known but small producing uh, produce, uh, you know, wineries that are internationally renowned and highly, highly expensive 
to major labels that I think most people in the world could not probably name off the top of their heads, something like, say, the Champagne of Dom Perignon. Uh, we get all the way down to the big bulk wine names that we think about from people like uh, Ernest Milio Gallo, right, or, you know, the waves like Woodbridge or Barefoot, things like that, um, bulk wine producers. And then there's the vast majority of wine producers in America numerically exist in the world of that very small case count of a much smaller uh, level of wine production. And uh, this, this got me thinking about how we engage with our wine world and some of the practical matters that we see as consumers. Um, about where we live in the country and what we're, what, are, what we have in as far as access, et cetera, as well. Uh, and some of the challenges that come along with trying to really get outside of just the quote unquote big box wineries that we are able to, uh, that we're able to get access to. Uh, you know, most wine stores, grocery stores, I mean, this is something we speak of oftentimes. In fact, what's the grocery store grab is really themed around is the idea of we want to talk about the wines that you have access to, the wines that you are going to encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. In my show at the Scarborough Renaissance Festival, uh, we do a worldwide tour of wines, but I work directly with a distributor to purchase and order the wines that I get for the show. So one of the challenges that I always had was sometimes I was able to get things that my customers, I could not point to my customers to a short store shelf and say, here's this, go buy it. Or even uh, directly sometimes answer the question, how much should that cost? Uh, because we, we're paying a distributor wholesale level cost rather than paying full retail. Well, that really got me in a mindset that one of the, the purposes behind many of the tastings that I do is that I work very hard to make sure that I bring customers uh, wines that they're going to be able to experience. Um, and there is a merit to that. There's the idea that, hey, I've got this, you can buy this, go out and try it. It's not it's not super hard to find. It's not really elite. It's not wildly expensive. Um, but that's the problem with that is that that leads us to a very middle of the road position of the world of wine. Plenty of quality labels out there are widely accessible. Don't get me wrong. We, we definitely have the ability to drink some amazing wine. And in fact, um, as, as many uh, have said in the industry, you know, we're kind of living in a golden time for wine as far as accessibility to high quality products. Um, it, you know, it isn't so many years in the past where the best wines or even mediocre quality were difficult to get through specialty stores and you know really it depended on where you happen to live in the world um you know and basically if you happened to be close to a area where you had a lot of wine consumers or you happen to be near an area that produced wine you might have access to a, a higher quality of product overall but the vast majority of folks would not necessarily have that same access so anyway the bottom line is we get a lot of really good wine out here there in the world but what we don't see is the little guy and this is a byproduct of, of history it's a function of economics and there's a lot of reasons why this is the way it is uh, but i wanted to kind of address some of the some of the pros and cons that go along with each of those so uh, to start with the big guys you know we've, we've already spoken that Sometimes what you get in in a in a big box store, grocery store, um, or any other sort of venue where uh, high volume is the order of the day, you're going to see challenges with getting varieties and a vis a vision, varieties of style in wine. Um, it takes a pretty good wine program to look at. Uh, even a single region of wine and really dive into the many different subtypes that, that might be, you know, or even uh, stylistical differences between uh, winemakers within a region. Uh, so for instance, you know, they, you might, and you can kind of see this reflected in certain ways when you go to uh, restaurants. Restaurant menus are often similarly aligned and that is they align to what sells, right? When you look at a place that does, that does 
liquor retail or does you know even a you know a wine section of a grocery store or a wine section of say uh, a place like say Costco or you know a big box or a really big box like a, a what are the word, word I'm looking for a bulk retailer um, you're going to see that, that while they have got a reasonable selection of products enough to keep their customers interested they don't necessarily have things that are more unique they're not going to go out on a limb and put shelf space out there for something that people don't recognize and in fact we've even talked here on the show several times about some of the marketing tools that wineries use to to help customers get the product that they hope that they need um, for instance the grape known as petite syrah its original name of durif uh, wasn't really well known as what it was in the united states and so california and their infinite wisdom of trying to get their wine to to market renamed the grape to this French sounding thing, Petit Syrah. It's actually a sub blend of, you know, it's actually a, a different species than the Syrah grape, but it's got it in, in its heritage. And it's a very different style of grape. But what it did is it got people to try out the product, to try that something that sounded f- funny and French and cool. Um, similar story happened with the uh, with the, the Sauvignon Blanc grape in California when they had some awful harvest and were trying to get out from underneath a negative stigma. And so they they, they created the uh, the concept of the... Uh, we're drawing a total blank now what the name is. I was just, I was just thinking of it. Um, they, we have the Fumé Blanc, right? The Fumé Blanc is not an actual grape varietal name. It's just another nickname for Sauvignon Blanc that was used in California for marketing the grape because Sauvignon Blanc had such a bad reputation for uh, because of some several bad years of vintages. So anyway, Mar- what I'm trying to get to is that marketing-wise and access-wise is always going to be a challenge when it comes to sales being the primary driver of things. Um, and I'm not even speaking right now about the ultra hard to find, really, you know, stuff you're only going to find at auction, you know, prestigious uh, slash, uh, you know, uh, wines that you find at auction kind of thing. You know, so we're not talking about the, uh, you know, Domaine, Domaine Romani Conti here. We're not talking about these, these very elite, very small production things, but that have high, high reputation and high, high price. Um you know, you'd be amazed. You can find some very expensive wines at some very simple places. Um, you know, even my local Total Wine has bottles that sell for you know four-digit numbers. And you know, you ask yourself that that you know whether that market's going to really be there. Well, obviously they're putting it there because they think they have an opportunity, and that's that's cool. But um, back to the to, to the vice of large stores slash large volume. The history effect here that comes into play is the idea around the distribution system. As I said before, I work directly with a distributor for the wines out at Scarborough Renaissance Festival. And it's great because I've got access to their entire portfolio uh, of wines from a lot of different wineries, hundreds and hundreds of different wineries. And that's, that's you know, a great at resource for me to be able, as an educator, to be able to pass on to you guys, to be able to say, hey, check this out. This is something I found when I wanted to do an example of this style or this region or this grape however just because i pick out that one weird case that that uh i think was an interesting selection doesn't mean you're going to see that same wine at your local retailer uh now uh, i have clued you guys in uh several times on this but uh, a good a good trick with a reasonably uh, good wine store uh, is to ask the manager or ask the the, the sales staff if they have access to something that you don't see on their shelves, uh, they may be more than happy to purchase it from their distributor on be, on your behalf. Sometimes as little as single bottle quantities, or even if, uh, maybe they might require a case level quantity. Uh, but it basically, you're doing them a favor by saying, hey, I would like this product and them not having to store it on their shelves anytime. That instant sale is often a very gratifying thing for them. So. Don't hesitate to say, hey, I'm really looking for X, Y, or Z, this very specific thing. They can look it up on their, you know, in their system, find out whether they've got access to it. And several of them even have access to multiple distributors as well. So you're, what you're seeing is more than just, uh, more than just the actual uh, single distributor thing that I'm talking about, but you actually get bigger access to what the entire store has got. So um, big has that mono, has that monolithic problem. Big doesn't move fast. 
Big is also afraid to take risks. Um, I think one of the things you're going to find with a lot of larger wine producers, larger wine brands, uh, and even multi-brands like, say, like Constellation or things like that, where you've got a reputation that's on the line and you're not willing to take high risks uh, to with your with that money uh, and to, just to see on a product that may or may not work. This kind of reminds me of the movie business a little bit where, you know, deciding that you're going to make the next comic book movie based on popular franchise X is a pretty safe bet compared to a lot of the independent films that are out there being made by very creative people. They might be the best and coolest creative idea in the world. They might be the next Oscar winner, but the way the studios approach that is very uh, investment-like rather than necessarily artistically driven. And that's a feature of larger businesses. Uh, wine is no different. So think about that when we think about uh, when, you're not, when, when you're going to see different trends coming around. Um, we have indeed talked about trends like uh, barrel aging, right? We talked about that being an idea that that was an industry-driven push uh, by, the, by the industry rather than something that consumers started tasting on their own and going, man, wouldn't it be cool if? So you're going to see that a lot. But let's talk about the little guy. Let's flip it around and go to the other side of the street. Um, one of the documentaries that I was watching is called uh, Tin City, about Paso Robles, uh, California. Uh, an area, wine, wine area that's basically halfway between San Francisco and LA, the very large wine producing area and a really dynamic place in the world of wine. Meaning they have got an environment and a, an economy that has allowed a lot of small time wine producers to go and experiment. And for the last, oh, probably 10, 10 11 years or so, you've seen, um, you know, this, this uptick in small producers doing their own thing at very low level, very low volume. In other words, they're not producing a million cases of wine. They're not even producing, you know, sometimes they're not even producing tens of thousands of cases of wine. They're producing wines in the, sing, in the thousands or single thousand, single digit thousand uh, levels of wine, uh, which is a, a very interesting niche place to be because when you have that small brand, when you've got that tight level of control, um, it comes with a, it's a double-edged sword. It's a, one being that you are personally both responsible for the product end to end in your consumer's eyes, but that also means you're personally responsible for the product of end to end. You get the credit for uh, producing this amazing quality product at the end of the day. Um, when we talk uh, about that, um, one of the things that comes up a lot is the idea of um, handcrafted or artisanal. And it's an interesting word when I think about the beverage industry. And uh, Bob over at Two Penny and I have this conversation. Uh, I've had it many times, and it's an ongoing philo philosophical uh, conversation, and not a debate by any means, because you know there is there isn't really an answer to this. But that is, what is the virtue of flaw? in a handcrafted and artisan versus the consistency of, of uh, mechanization, industrialization, chemistry, science, whatever you want to call it on this side of the scale. That when it comes down to things that are, things that are made by hand are going to have inherent flaws in them. They're going to have variations. And especially in the world of wine where we have an agricultural input from mother nature, we are going to have variation that we always have to deal with with that. In other words, it's why we bother putting vintage years on bottles of wine, right? Because we know because we know that this year might have a different flavor, taste, or texture than next year. Um, it's also why we put labels that involve place, because we know that wines from this particular vineyard can taste different from that particular vineyard, even though the two are very close together. So um, those expressions of difference are something that in the wine world kind of comes along as par for the course. But in a big scale way, though those things can be seen as a flaw in and of themselves. You have to go up the chain a pretty decent amount before customers are willing to assume risk in getting an occasionally lackluster product 
when they're really hoping for something that's astounding. And uh, while modern winemaking methods have allowed wines overall to become more consistent and, ha and good years and bad years are measured by how high quality they were rather than whether they're quality or not quality uh, has really uh, kind of cemented our modern wine world. So anyway, Paso Robles, this tin city is really a great example of these people coming together and doing all these very small wineries. This area is this old industrial, well, not even old. It's all basically been made from scratch, but ba but it's an industrial area of uh, that were basically, you know, aluminum warehouse style buildings that they converted and started specializing in doing uh, basically spirits and uh, spirits, beer and wine uh, as as a special function. Uh, and so you have all these wineries in this very tight area that's outside the actual city. Um, and they have kind of come together to put all the resources in it, but it allows a lot of very small wineries to have really kind of tiny operations at a reasonable cost. Um, because if you think about the business aspect of making wine, the, you know, not only are you trying to purchase the agricultural product itself, but then of course you've got all the physical building plant that goes into the production of wine, of turning that grape into you know, the stuff that we drink in the glass. And by keeping those costs reasonable, you can allow even small time wine producers that produce you know very, very, very limited amounts of wine that can be fantastically interesting, dynamic, risk taking, things that the big guys would never do. Uh, and then interestingly enough, if you watch, you know, several of the documentaries that I've seen that have this kind of mindset, you also get the idea that it's also part of that kind of culture of the small wine producer, that being different uh, is, is a purposeful choice, that being uh, constantly aware of changing conditions and being able to uh, embrace and actively uh, chase down opportunities these small winemakers are stumbling across a lot of the things that I think are really, uh, really important for us to understand um, and for, important for us to get a hold of. Um, it would be wonderful if we could have access to that on a greater level. And the good news there is that the modern world is making that more accessible. Um, I think what we see is things like direct-to-consumer shipping and the right to have wine shipped to you now is getting more and more popular throughout more and more of our United States. Uh, it's not universal yet, but it's getting there. But that idea that I can have wine from anywhere shipped to me uh, and the fact that so there's also you know, with the, the, the advent of online sales in general, the infrastructure has made it more efficient to to ship and uh, even though there are of course inherent risks with shipping with shipping the product that we've talked about before with temperature vibration heat control that, that kind of thing but i think what's important to know is that you're getting these opportunities to get access and so now what we need are the tools for these small winemakers to be able to access more folks um, obviously their number one sales channel is going to be give me somebody in the tasting room taste their wine, fall in love with it, join their mailing list, and they've, you know, they've become a lifelong customer, at least hopefully. Um, many regular, you know, many full, you know, many, many large wineries run under that same model where they might have products that you will see at the liquor store or grocery store, but they also have exclusive products that they offer only to their club members because they produce them in lower quantities. Um, they also want that feeling of, of inclusiveness. They want that feeling of, of, you know, of customer ownership. When, when, they, when they know that a certain portion of your wine budget is going towards them, they're very willing to, make, you know, to have that special feeling and offer really cool and interesting wines. So... I am very excited about the opportunity when it comes to trying out some of these harder to find things. What I'm trying to decide for Wine Journal overall is how we together share that sort of idea. Uh, because either we're, you know, going to, it's going to be on an individualized basis for people with their own personal choices, their own, their own experiences, or it can be some of the form of 
like the grocery store grab where I can bring through and make people aware of, you know, the opportunities to join some of these clubs, chose some of these, these wine lists, et cetera. Um, and I think that there's some opportunity that uh, could go a little bit further there because so far I have refrained from keeping that as part of the content of the show simply out of the fact of, you know, as I said earlier about access, we want people to be able to get access to the, to the booze that we're trying. So we're going to pilot something with this, I think, where we're going to try um, some of our Patreon members, myself, we're going to get together with a couple of them I have existing club memberships. Um, we're going to talk about their experiences, and I'm going to kind of sum them up into, into you know, some format. But also, we'll use those as a baseline example of where we start and what, what one can expect by getting involved with a program like that. And this, once again, is not to turn into a sales channel, right? And the idea is not me shilling for uh, any given somebody's wine club. It's more, mostly about these wines are available this way only. You're not going to be, I can't point you down to Total Wine to go buy this. I can't point you on wine.com. Instead, this is the way, this is the way that you get a hold of these. So there's nothing, you know, there, there's no, none to be done about that kind of stuff. So uh, with that, uh, we, you know, you can start to get a hold of, and one of the things I will try and seek out is that really looking for uh, some of these, some, some of these places that are really off the beaten path, um, and not necessarily anybody that you're going to see, and you know, outside of a local restaurant list, maybe if you go to the particular areas where they're from. Uh, so expect to see that. Um, I'm also leaning heavily towards putting Paso Robles as a as a uh, destination for touring um, they've got a lot of wineries within a reasonable distance and then it isn't uh, the Napa Sonoma area which while I love dearly is of course un, you know has been suffering under there from the fires from last year things like and while I'm not going to abandon one for the other it's certainly an area I think that could that could uh, benefit from uh, opening the eyes from a lot of folks I mean of the, the wine customers that I talk to who have been to, you know, California's wine country, 98% of the bulk of them are going to Napa and Sonoma. They're going to the north part of the world, right? So very few of them are getting outside anything of that because that's what, you know, most people from outside the state think of as the wine country. Um, you know, some of them might have gone to Santa Barbara, but, but very few um, actually get down to the middle of the state because, well, guess what? Unfortunately, Paso Robles isn't the easiest to get to. It's kind of, as I said, midway between. But look for that coming up here pretty soon. Um, and in addition, uh, to, to get some pre-tease going on for events in April, um, we're going to be heading down to Fredericksburg to go film down there for a couple of days. And we're going to go check out some Texas wineries. I've had many, many requests for folks about which Texas wineries that I like and do this. And um, as you guys know, from a tour perspective, etc., I'm not going to take you to a place of whose wines I don't I don't cotton to. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to endorse a product in any way, shape, or form that I personally wouldn't drink. And so that means I need to go put in some time behind the glass uh, down there. So we're going to go check it out. We're going to find out some of the places. We're going to figure out what the format looks like. But we're probably going to do a live show from down there. So instead of doing a Friday night show uh, online on Zoom that way, we will do a Zoom show live cast from some... Uh, exotic texas location so hopefully that will know more about that when it comes to april so anyway think about the little guys and uh we'll like keep you guys updated as we try to try to delve into that topic more over the course of 2021 i think you guys are going to find some really fun things and some uh some uh diamonds in the rough so to speak that you can come share with your friends so all right, well, let's switch over to doing the uh, grocery store grab since we've uh, mentioned it several times already in the show. Um, to begin with, uh, the grocery store grab, as you may know, is our attempt to get the best value per dollar for wines found at non-specialty and non-big box retailers. Uh, we are looking basically to make sure that we get good value and we want to use the wine's label to help us determine how that works. Uh, Good wine labeling is something I think that is uh, highly underrated, as unfortunately, and we uh, try and look for wines that have good labels that tell us the information that we want to know. Uh, 
specifically, we want words about where the wine is bottled, where it's great, where the grapes are grown, uh, what the wine tastes like, especially. Uh, we don't want to be trapped with a bunch of just marketing words and fluff. We really want to know what's in the bottle. So uh, I choose. I don't do prior research to choose these. Um, we didn't have any little guy wine that I was going to display for today. That was a bit more of a later thing. So today, again, the grocery store grab doesn't really align with that. So from our grocery store grab today, we have got Diseño Old Vine Malbec from Mendoza, Argentina. Uh, let me go ahead and flip over here to my image tab. I'll show you what the label looks like. Very simple, very elegant, uh, simply naming the winery itself. Uh, what caught my attention with this actually was the idea that they're using the marketing term old vine now. They have picked up on uh, the, the U.S. habit of using that. Um, interestingly, though, they, of course, never suffered under prohibition, so they don't have that same kind of barrier at that century level. Although, remember that wines, vines, wine vines, as they grow older, tend to produce less fruit. So old vines are supposed to produce less fruit, but it's supposed to have more concentrated flavor. So we're going to put their old vine words to the test here. From the back of this label, we have this annual old vine Malbec and Argentina from Mendoza. Uh, Malbec has thrived in Argentina since the 1800s, where cuttings were transplanted from their original home in France. Now considered amongst the world's most distinguished red wines, Malbec flourishes in Mendoza. Argentina's most highly respected vignerons supply Diseño Malbec from old growth vineyards in Mendoza. Vines grow in fertile, rich soil with old mineral deposits integrated by heavy winter snow, no, irrigated, sorry, by heavy winter snow melt from the Andes glaciers. Okay, so all that first two paragraphs is all basically to say, here's where we are and here's what Malbec is and make sure that you know we mentioned the word Mendoza and Argentina like four times. So definitely know where it's from. They're definitely telling us as much as they can about it. Um, that does though indicate that um, Diseño does not necessarily own their own vineyards, that they they have vineyards who are basically growing and they're buying fruit from different locations, which is good and bad. It's good in the sense that they're getting their pick. Um, it's difficult or challenging in the sense that they may have inconsistencies with we don't know where their grapes come from. Um, now, here's the final thing. Diseño Malbec is a rich wine with an inviting bouquet of stone fruit. A hint of coffee complements the blueberry spice and chocolate flavors. Okay, so there's our flavor word package. That's what we're really trying to get out of here. What's the dang thing taste like? Now, this is not an independent winery. They are a part of, they're imported by Constellation Brands, says here on the label. Um, and again, it is a pro, Mendoza product of Argentina. So they've got, um, and let's see, what do they say on our bottle? They're also, yep, they're saying at 13.5% alcohol by volume. So pretty average what we'd expect to see so far out of a stylistically normal uh, Argentinian Malbec. Um, the interesting... Um, choice there in their flavor words that I found was the bouquet of stone fruit. Usually when we think of stone fruits in the wine world, we're usually in the white wine world and we're talking about peaches and apricots um, and pitted fruits like that. Um, well, stone fruits in this case, in the red wine world, I'm assuming we're talking about plums. So we will uh, see how this wine actually shakes out when it comes to uh, their aromas. Here in just a second, let me give myself a, a little swirl here. Uh, Color-wise, it is a nice, deep uh, purple color, right? It is uh, definitely trending on that purple-ish side, which we like. Um, but uh, we're going to check a look, take, take a look here, and uh, let's give ourselves an aroma test here. Let's see if we can find that, that stone fruit. Well, I think... That's, I mean, I'm. it could be a case of me convincing myself into it, but there is definitely a, a uh, dark fruit and easily I could, I could see where they're going for that stone fruit plum. Um, either in that dark red uh, stone, you know, dark red plum all the way to that, you know, that fully black plum. It doesn't have uh, a ton of, uh, of other fruit flavors, uh, so it kind of stands out by itself. Um, I might call it blackberry, but even then, uh, a plum is a pretty darn accurate uh, presentation there. I, I'm, I'm surprised they didn't use that word instead of stone fruits, but there you go. Um, 
again, might also be a cultural issue, right? Uh, so one of the things we found out in our South African wine tasting, right? We were talking about how different cultures talk about and speak about fruits and flavors in different ways than we do here in the U.S. So anyway, um, let's find out wh whether we uh, get the rest of their uh, cans of coffee and, and, and blueberry in here as far as the taste is concerned. Okay, um, this is probably one of the best, um, you know, on point labels that I've seen in a while. As far as fruit is concerned, blueberry on the mouth is a dead ringer. Um, absolutely the first thing that came to mind. Um, it's got a nice level of acidity and juiciness to it. It's not very, it's not a big, bold, but big flat wine. Um, it also doesn't have, uh, it doesn't have a big heavy body weight to it. It's actually a very medium weight wine as far as uh, red wines, red wines and even Malbecs are concerned. Malbecs being um, fan, you know, very, very big fandom in the Malbec world for its uh, more than Merlot flavor, but less than Zinfandel spicy, if you will. Um, people often describe it as spicy. I don't get that uh, peppery kind of thing going on here or any of the prizines that, uh, that we might see, the green peppers that we might smell out of one of these uh, ex-former Bordeaux varietals. But, now, yeah, very fruit forward with that, that, that blueberry. Tannins are kind of young and grippy, but they fade pretty quickly into that blueberry fruitiness. So very easy drink. Um, not really finding the coffee or, or chocolate flavor, however. Um, let me sit here and, and chew on the uh, on the finish here for a minute, and maybe that'll show up. But yeah, really, so much. Uh, I'm getting much more of that solid fruit, a little bit of minerality. You know, uh, really a solid drink. Uh, not not disappointed in any way, shape, or form. Um, but certainly a, a good middleweight, uh, non complicated uh, Malbec. Uh, by the way. Price point wise, this was I think advertised at 17 and final price with the club card. So the actual price was well, it was just eleven dollars. Uh, for an eleven dollar ten to ten to fifteen dollar bottle of wine, this is this is really good in that in that price point. This is a this is a solid contender for a sub fifteen dollar wine. So um, so we ask ourselves three questions with the grocery store grab, and that is, you know, is it well executed? Absolutely. Uh, the wine doesn't have any flaws in it. It is well made. It is solid all the way through. It's not highlighting any one item or another, and it's not out of balance. Um, is it on style? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I think for for, men, for the uh, traditional Malbec fans, you'll find this to be the lighter end of the scale, but very drinkable, very enjoyable. Um, cannot complain about that one at all. And is it worth the price tag? Oh yeah, I mean, eleven bucks. Uh, this is definitely a buy again if you're if that's the market you're in for. Um, this could be a go to uh, very easily. And I think uh, Constellation picked a winner when they decided to partner with these guys and start importing because this is. I, I have certainly had far less capable or far uh, you know uh, less approachable versions of Malbec at the price point. Um, remember that's one of the one of the other appeals uh, that Malbec comes through with is the fact that we're getting a lot of really decently quality wine at fairly low price points. Uh, the you know the oh basically the differentials in 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 trade and economy allow a very good quality product to come across uh, here. So they're selling it for very very cheap there, so they can sell it for a fairly inexpensive price here. So I am very much approved. I like that. So. All right, uh, any questions, so comments, rash political statements from the peanut gallery? Heard me ramble for a while. We've done our grocery store grab. I will recap uh, some of the things that are going on before we sign off, though, this afternoon. Um, date night wine package is up. Um, this two weeks from now, uh, so not this Friday, but the Friday next, we'll be doing aromatic white wines on the Friday night Zoom meeting. Um, so come prepared to enjoy some nice, uh, light, fur, you know, very fruit-forward, aromatic wines. Um, although we're, we're, we're doing, I think, a 
Torontes from Argentina. We're doing uh, Gavros Demeanor and some others. Uh, so uh, tickets for that will be posted tomorrow. I've got to finish uh, the getting the wine purchase to make sure that I've got it. Um, so I'm going to get that done. And so tomorrow, once that's confirmed, tickets will go on sale for the rest of March because um, then we're doing Wine and Cheese Part 9 at the end of the month. Uh, then the live shows, we got beer and wine this weekend, spring fling the next weekend. So looking forward to anybody who can join us at either one of those and uh, all good. So um, as far as closing comments, you know, grab yourself a comment for the comments section if you guys have the time later. Um, share us any of the uh, little guys that you're particularly fond of. Um, those little wineries that are, you know, just trying to make good and, you know, doing it for the love of the vine. If you've got somebody in there that you're a big club fan of and would like us to consider uh, on those upcoming things, drop those names in there. We'll share it around and we'll take an opportunity to uh, find out what they're like. So, all right, guys. Well, I appreciate all of you. Did. Oh, wait a minute. I totally forgot. I had this little note and it was it was on the other copy of, of items to do today. But we hit our 100th YouTube subscriber. We talked about this last week, but I want to say, hooray, it's official, we've got that. Um, so hopefully we'll get a new URL soon, but that means you can also expect a show upcoming from Flynn Markley. Uh, I think it will tie wonderfully into the beginning of the Scarborough Renaissance Festival season. So we will look forward to seeing a silly show on Wine Shark Wednesday, specifically devoted to some off-topic weirdness that was brought to you by Flynn Markley himself. So anyway. I want to say thank you guys very much. I hope you guys have enjoyed the show and uh, come and see me again. Uh, until such time, raise a glass on your own and cheers. We'll see you next time. Now I got to go see if there goes my cassoulet because it's done on day three. Hooray, good beans. All right, talk to you later, guys.